so I think, uh, feel free to continue to in, uh, introduce yourself. We are going to go on ahead and get started. Anyone who comes in after um, will just sort of let themselves in. So just basic housekeeping, uh, feel, feel free to have your cameras on, turn your cameras off, whatever makes you happy. Um, do your best to keep yourselves muted. That way we don't uh, have any noise in the background. Um, and like I said, I am Kimberly Poe. Ashley turned her camera off. Ashley Sklar, she's our new community engagement consultant and adult services and community engagement consultant you got it there it is there it is that title was made up so i haven't figured it out yet um so i want to thank ashley for being here with me this was um something this presentation was something that i saw during my transforming teen services training i know some of you know about that but after talking to ashley we felt that not only was it important uh to kind of learn outside of teen services but just like across the across the state anyway um so i am going to stop talking at nothing um and i'm going to introduce our presenter for the day verena i tried Get okay. I'm Get sorry. I, you know, we also had a lovely chat about names. Um, who is going to uh, talk to us about community asset mapping? Um, and thank you, Verena, so much for for tuning in with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I just want to say, if if anyone is is game to keep your video on, it is nice to sometimes have a little base to look at with the nodding. So you can on and off keep your video on for me. Um, but I will start to share my screen now. So um, I'm glad that I roped you in with the word, well, community asset mapping may have been the word that roped you in, or maybe it was the word curious. That was a trick because most people who work in libraries are curious. So I thought it would identify all of you. Um, my, my route to this topic today, um, this is kind of my very unscientific path, uh, my career path, where curiosity has led me. I worked in an academic library in technical services for a while. Then I, I went blue at the University of Michigan for library school, but then promptly went into nonprofit non data management, and then found my way back to libraries where I am now at the State Library Services, which is in the Minnesota Department of Education. I work on um, the annual report for public libraries, um, and I also work with libraries on how to use the data. So asset mapping is not it's programming. That's not my area of expertise. I'm coming to this, um, this topic from a, from a spirit of learning and sharing, but it is kind of related to learning about the community around uh, a library. So um, I'll be pointing you to experts and resources along the way, but mostly we're just going to be looking at what this whole idea is. But first, I just wanted to do a little head scratcher, thought provoker. And for this, for this exercise, I'd like you to think about this past year in your life. Kim and Ashley and I were just talking about the past three months <laughs> and how unexpected they've been. But really this whole last year has probably been um, a time of upending and disruption and, and tumult, no matter who you are and what your situation has been. So what I'd like you to do right now is think about the last year in your life and try to think of something good that you discovered that you didn't know you had. So this could be something that you discovered in the back of your closet while you were decluttering. This could be something that you found within yourself that helped you to survive and thrive. This could be some resource or service um, in the community. Just think of something good that you discovered that was available to you that you didn't know you had. Just give you like 15 seconds to think about that. All right, hope you came up with something good. I'm putting a link in the chat to a poll where you can tell me what kind of thing you, you thought of, what was your discovery? And I'm gonna, let's see, uh, show you what you should be seeing if you go to that. You should be seeing this. 
if you go to that link. So you'd be able to. Oh, tell Karina, me. I, you might have to stop sharing and resharing. We still see the slide. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This is what you should see. And then, okay, can we see this? Good. Oh, nice. And now the next thing is we're going to share, so. Oh, you're all good at putting things in categories. I didn't know what categories <laughs> would be relevant. All right, let's start hearing from people. Um, let's start hearing from the, anyone who thought of something from that group about support from other people or groups. Can you put it in the chat or tell me, open, unmute yourself. I have taken to calling uh, several of us at work who have been weathering this together, my COVID coven, um, because I like the alliteration, um, but also because it's been um, the only way to get through. That's your coworkers? Yes. Sorry, I answered on mute. I went, yes. And I was like, yeah. nope, still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning how to mute read, I feel like. <laughs> All right, we're seeing a lot of support from kids. That's great. Your own, your own children, boss, college friends. Yes, that's great. All right, how about a personal quality? You can still put things in the chat if you want, but what about a personal quality? What was something you discovered about yourself? <laughs> yes. It was, I read this morning there was a shortage of butter at different times last year. Actually, I read something else about it, but I'll save that for another time. Okay, less sleep than you thought. All right. You discovered you have incredible endurance for dealing with uncertainty and monotony. That's a great discovery to have made. Stamina, the ability to ask for help. Wonderful. And okay, some time at the parks and rec building. Yes. Okay. So that, that moves on to the other thing. Did you find who discovered an object or a physical space that you didn't know was there? <laughs> comfy, the comfy spot on your couch, yeah. Yep, outdoor spaces. That's amazing. Two fantastic walking trails less than a mile from your house and hiking areas. Yeah. Great. Well, I mean, so that was just a little exercise, obviously, um, but it's the spirit of asset mapping because it's about looking at what is what exists, what's around you, what's in your neighborhood, what's in yourself um, that can be shared. And um, especially in the midst of, it doesn't have to be a time that's really great and wonderful. It can be right in the midst of confusing and uh, uncomfortable times that we can look for assets. So I will stop sharing to get back to my slide. Okay, so yes, example is great. So for the next uh, time, we will be Working through this agenda, um, we'll go over the history of the idea of community asset mapping, what the idea is, we'll look at how you can do it. Um, I've looked at lessons that other libraries have learned from implementing this. I've got a, several slides that I won't go into, but just so you know they're there of where you can learn more, and then we'll have time to discuss at the end. So the idea of asset mapping comes from um, asset-based community development, which is in one way an idea that's as old as the hills, in another way it's only from the late, like 
early 90s, uh, as formulated by these two men, Jody Kretzman and John McKnight, who were professors at, the, at Northwestern University. And in 1993, they published a book called Building Communities from the Inside Out where they shared their, their new idea, their, their revelation from having done community development in primarily urban settings. And the idea was that the most successful, sustainable community change happened when people within the community were driving the change. And the key to that sustained change was that people were focusing on their skills, the assets, the abilities that already exist in the community. So they weren't relying on external agencies or funding or just outside experts to come in and tell them what they needed. They were looking at what they already had and trying to solve their own problems. And so um, this was revolutionary, I guess, uh, at that time. Um, and I wanted to add this. There's, so I've, there's a link in the, in the end to this four page document that describes asset-based community development. So if you're interested, I would recommend that. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the guiding principles from asset-based community development. So everyone has gifts, relationships, build a community, listening, conversation, just to show that this, is, this idea is at its heart about people and connections. So um, there's a quote, uh, don't, you know, you, you can't, uh, I need to find the quote. You can't do anything with a deficit so ignore the deficits and focus on the skills and abilities in order to make change. So that's the concept behind asset mapping. Working on, oh, and the other thing about it is, so local assets are the primary building blocks of sustainable community development. This is a local idea. So what I'm sharing with you today are methods that are replicable, but the whole point of it is to be that it has to make sense to the people and the specific place and the context in which you are working. All right. So asset mapping, we're going to break down the phrase asset mapping into the two words. So we're looking at what is an asset and then we'll look at what mapping it means. Um, the simplest definition of an asset is this, gifts, skills, and capacities that can be shared with the community. And there are, depending on who you ask, various types of assets. I'm going to share five types of assets with you. And the first one is people. So what do individuals in the community know, what do they know how to do, what is their um, institutional you know, like knowledge, historical knowledge, what are they excited about, what are they interested in? These are the, these are at the heart of what makes a community, people. And then moving up one level from individuals, we look at what's called associations. So these are informal relationships. These could be friends groups, this could be that group of college friends who've been supporting each other. This could be a little bit broader like volunteer associations, um, boys and girls clubs, um, chambers of commerce, anything where people are voluntarily gathering together around a common interest. It could be formal or informal. They don't really have a lot of authority about it, but they're just, they're interested in something together. So that's, that's the idea of an association. And then the next level of an asset is institutions. So these are the things where there's people have come together professionally, they're getting paid, they have professions around this, they have um, structure, these are the most, the most structured, usually the most resourced assets in the community in terms of physical and financial resources. And these are also the assets that have some authority. They've been given some authority within the society. Um, so this is obviously government institutions, um, but also universities and schools, the media, um, businesses, local businesses, nonprofits, social service agencies, those are institutions. We don't want to forget physical assets within a community, the, the space that a lot of you mentioned, things that you discovered um, this year about places close to you um, that were helpful to your life. Um, so these could be trails, playgrounds, they could be empty, empty lots. Um, just what are the physical assets? They could be natural, like waterfalls and things. Okay, so then the most important um, asset is the connections, the exchange that happens between these other assets. And in the, in the words of asset-based community development, this is considered an expression of social capital. So the social, the trust, the cohesion that comes when 
um, individuals in a society are exchanging goods with each other um, and, and really building the community together. So those are the assets that we're talking about when we talk about asset mapping. And then when we talk about mapping it, we're just talking about making it a visual display of the assets that we've identified and the connections between them. So, I mean, I've got some examples here. This is, this is the most straightforward idea of an asset map. So you've got an actual physical map. And this is a, a librarian from Canada who said, okay, I'm a children's librarian. I want to know about the resources that are available within childcare within this, this you know, little neighborhood. So she made icons for like childcare and other things, schools, I don't know exactly what they are. That's, that's one idea of an asset map. This is a different idea for an asset map. So you've got the library at the center, the assets all around the edges, and then the connections, the lines between them, I'm sure you can't read these words because it's kind of busy, but um, the lines spell out the relationships between the library and banks or the library and daycare centers, what, what the library can provide to them and what those assets can contribute to the library. This is another example of an asset map that um, a library, the Free Library of Philadelphia has been doing a lot of work with asset mapping. So I found this from, from their resources. In this case, they made a PowerPoint and they said, these are the types of assets, daycare, schools, individuals. Then they named the specific um, assets that fall within those categories. And then they also have here this list of how those assets are related to the library. What's, what's the relationship like? What, what are we getting from them? What are they getting from us? What do they have that you know, maybe we could build a partnership around? So I guess I wanna stop for a second and ask if there are any questions before I get into the, how do we do this? Or comments? We look pretty good in the chat. I'm keeping an eye there, but just to verbalize, feel free to drop any questions in the chat. If someone has a question they can't quite figure out how to type into words, which I know I struggle with often, um, if you pull open like the chat feature um, or the participant, I can't remember which it is, you should see like a raise hand. If there's something that you have to say and, and you really feel like you need to verbalize it, feel free to hit that raise hand. It'll um, sort of bump you up so that um, Verena, Ashley, and I can see you up there so that we can call on you so you can verbalize your question. Great. All right. So how do we do this? These are the four basic steps of making an asset map. Now we're gonna go into each one of these. Determine the scope, make a team, find the assets, and then go somewhere with your map. Um, at this point, I wanna say the scope of, of the scale, I guess, of your asset mapping is really, can be scaled up or down, depending on the resources that you have. And that's what really this, this first step is about. Yes, I see a question. How would this be different from pulling up Google Maps? And I will get to that. Um, so you're gonna think about what the goal, first of all, what, what is the goal? Do you want to find out more about some people in the, in the community who don't use the library? Do you want to, are you, are you thinking about a new program? Do you want to um, have staff have a better understanding of what's available in your community so that they can strengthen their referral skills? Um, what is the goal of the asset map that you want to create? What kind of assets? You don't have to include all of those levels. It sort of depends on what, um, what you're trying to do with the map. It's really important to determine the size of the community because you don't want to do an asset map on the entire city, for example. Um, it just would get too, too full and too complicated. Um, and then what resources do you have? Do you have a whole team that's waiting, that's sitting side waiting to do this? Do you, is it just you and... Google in a few hours. Um, so take a look at that and think about what the scope of your asset map is going to be. And then the next step, this is really important since this is all about people and relationships, it's important to have a team, at least two people, maybe three people, maybe more, because um, for two reasons. One is that they'll, they'll bring in more perspectives, more people equals more perspectives. 
Um, and another is that this is actually having a team of people is a way, like, this can be a way to, to engage the community through doing this work. So if you're interested in increasing partnerships and understanding more about what people in the, in the neighborhood think, pull them in to this work so that they can be a part of and they can, they can make the connections in this part. Um, the next part is about identifying assets. So this, here's where the, the road diverges into either talking to people or looking things up. And looking things up works if you are trying to identify um, the level of assets that are a little higher, like associations or um, institutions or physical, because those are things you can just look up through looking at directories. I think I've got some. Yeah, you can look at community profiles. People may have already done some of this work. Um, looking at the demographics, say, of a, of a neighborhood and the resources that are there. You can look at directories. Um, the, the nature of the group, if it's a formal group, tells you what their strength or capacity might be. And so that's the way that you can usually get, get at groups for a first pass. Talking to people is important. First of all, it, it can be more difficult because there are many more people and you have to actually talk to them to know what an individual's skills and capacities and, and know-how are. Um, and the other thing about people, talking to people, is that you can understand the things that aren't written down about what their goal is, what their mission is, what their, what their current um, interests and, and values are. This can include the the leaders of community groups and associations. Um, this is also the part of asset mapping that is the most um, lively and engaging, especially in non-COVID times. Walking a neighborhood, actually canvassing, going from door to door is a really traditional part of asset mapping that is challenged um, in this current time. I mentioned the we can game here. This is Asset mapping is something that can be done in community meeting settings, which is again something that's not happening as much as it as it might have. Um, but you can still organize focus groups and just talk to people to unearth the both their own individual connections and the, the connections and the resources that they know about. And so I'm actually not going to go into a lot of detail about how to make the maps. Um, but the point of the asset map is to is to follow it. You know, we make maps to see what's out there and because we want to go somewhere. So it's really important when you're thinking about asset mapping to not get stuck in the making of it, but to think of it um, as the tool that will get you out the library, um, out into the community and becoming a part of these, this network of connections. Okay, so I looked at, um, I'm going to try to answer the question about how this would be different from pulling up Google Maps now. So pulling up Google Maps can be the first step in that you're looking at the, the map and saying, okay, here, here are the known places, and then you can add to it, you can make a My Maps and add your own little icons to it. The difference would be that what, what's really important is what you know about those, those places and what their connection is. To, to each other, to the library. So, um, you know, this is about contacts that you have. It's, some people have said this is sort of like a directory sometimes. So it's, it's you, you're saying these are, the, these are the assets, these are the contact people, this is how to get a hold of them. But you're also talking about the library's history with them um, and what, what they bring and, and what the library could bring to, to common, um, missions and common goals. So that's, so there's a, an additional level of kind of interpretation that you wouldn't just have from looking at a Google map. Okay, so a couple of the lessons learned from the libraries. I, the libraries at the bottom here are the ones that I've, that I found that had done work and published something about it. So one of the things that they said was leaving the library was really important. Getting out into the into the community. Um, some of these places, they said they were, the, it was the first time that anyone from the library had had made a face-to-face -face introduction. Um, so actually going into other spaces was really important. And staff felt revitalized in, they got new ideas about um, what, 
what was needed, what was what was available, and what the possibilities were to to do this work to improve the community. But there's a real um, understanding that not all staff are in a position to leave the library. That can be a drawback to this work, as with any other kind of um, evaluation or strategic planning. It sort of can be seen as as above the day to day work, and that can be a real challenge for. Um, some staff who are, who are really um, stuck um, in, in their roles. One of, if you're interested in this idea, for the next couple of slides, I've got this little blue box that you, could, you can do a little activity. So in this case, I'm saying, if you're interested in asset mapping, what I'd like you to do is write down the names of a couple of people who might be interested in doing this with you, people outside the library. So another um, lesson learned from these libraries was that for in many communities, not all, but in many communities, libraries are seen as trusted institutions. So it's, it just makes sense for them to be the ones who are trying to bring unearth connections and bring other organizations together. And when this worked well, they said the library really became um, a place part of the whole network of connections that was happening within the community. This was specifically the Halifax Public Library who um, focused on services to immigrant groups within their community. So they said, you know, the library is one of a number of places, a number of groups who are serving this population. And the, the lesson is to be humble because they're, they're you know, you'll, you'll discover as you get out into the world that others may be doing something very similar. They could be doing it better. Um, the library is not, this is, this is one of several methods where the library is, is not the center, unlike the, the asset map that I showed you. The library is a part of all of the things that are going on within the community. So to apply this idea, I thought you could write down a program or service that you want to ap apply this, this method to that might, that where it might be a good fit, or write down a, a segment of, a population group within your community that you'd like to better understand. And then um, the last kind of theme of lessons learned was that um, it's about the method. So this was a great way to generate new contacts, maybe people that you hadn't thought of working with the library before and new ideas. Um, and one library said it started small, but it really built momentum. But the caution is that depending on the, the data that you're gathering, it could take a lot of time to actually make sense of it, especially qualitative data. If you're doing a lot of that face-to-face -face talking with people, um, uh, collecting, actually collecting the information and making it um, uh, shareable. Um, for example, Google Maps, you can put a lot of work into making a great Google Map and adding notes to things. But as far as I know, you can't export that information into a list. So that's something just to be thinking about as you're, as you're setting up the map. How do we want, ultimately we wanna be able to share this. We want other people to be able to be a part of this. We wanna update this. Um, yes, and thanks, I, I meant to say that. These are huge systems, exactly. Um, and that's a good question. I didn't find examples of smaller libraries. I have been just very beginning of working with um, some libraries in Minnesota, one of which is like a few people on staff. Um, to see how this can be um, applied in those settings. But that is a good question. We can talk about that further. So um, what did I say here? I thought we could do, yeah, just write down the name of one other library staff member that you could share this idea with. Man, coming in on time. Because, so the, the next few slides I have are just the resources that I pulled together of various libraries who have been doing this type of work. Um, these are more general resources about asset mapping, what it means. And then these are some resources for actually doing asset mapping. So the first three are um, places to go to get data on the community. And then the last three are places that you can go to look at these some of the other methods that meh, methods that I was talking about, like doing that focus group or um, 
kind of walking the neighborhood sorts of things. So any questions before we go to what we're going to do next is like break into breakout groups um, so that you can have smaller conversations and then come back together. But before we do that, are there any questions? Was there anything missing that you thought you were going to hear that you didn't? Anybody? Nobody? I guess everybody's all right. Okay. So, um, three groups, three breakout rooms, three questions, whatever, and we have a Google Jamboard. Um, so Kim will put a link to the Jamboard. Yep. I'm just dropping some folks into rooms now. Um, so there are gonna be about 11 or 12 of you per room. Um, I tried to make it, sorry, Ashley, I put you in a room on accident. Um, so you can just leave it when you get in there. Um, so the way that a Jamboard works, it's a Google document and um, you're all, oh, Oh, yes, Sam. So um, I see your question here about the recording. So we are recording this. Um, we are going to send, by we, I mean Ashley, is going to send out an email um, with supplemental materials and the recordings at the end of this. We're also going to make sure that we post the recording um, somewhere probably on our, our um, continuing education page. Um, we'll make sure that we send the links to that um, the link to where that is located for you as well. Okay, so what we are about to do, and I actually think it might be helpful if I did a quick screen share just to show you all what um, a Jamboard is and, and what that's kind of situated like just in case anyone doesn't already know. Um, I don't want to assume folks are using this technology if they're not. So this is a Jamboard. It is Google-based. It is similar to the whiteboard feature in Zoom, if anyone has used that. You all should have the ability to share. We're going to post the link into the chat. Um, you'll see at the top here, there um, are numbers. We currently have three Jamboards set up. So all of you will go into one of three rooms. If you're in room one, you're going to be here on page one. If you are in room two, you're going to click this arrow for the next frame and you are going to be working on page two. If you've been assigned to room three, you're going to hit the arrow and you're going to come to page three. This is an interactive board. You can come here and click text box and write some words down. You can uh, be fancy and add um, some pictures. You can change the background. There is an eraser, I think. That's not what this is, so ignore that. Um, but basically it's an interactive board, uh, group three, erase my word, word. Um, but you're basically going to be answering the questions that are on this, um, on the tops of these pages with images, GIFs, words, charts, whatever, um, is going to allow you to be, to, to sort of get your point across. Okay. So most people are back. Welcome back. Um, I don't know. Did you feel, did you, did you have enough time? Did you feel... Cut off. Was anyone in the middle of a sentence? Seeing some shaking of heads. Okay. Well, I'm glad you were able to find some things. Can I hear from some people in, in group two about what your discussion was like, about what's exciting about this and what's made possible by doing this work? And feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, whoever would like to speak. Unfortunately, I can't remember who's in group two, so I can't just like obnoxiously call on somebody. Okay, well, because I work with you guys, it's Maria. I'm going to talk. <laughs> Maria, thanks. <laughs> we had so much excitement. We were so excited about the excitement that we didn't talk so much about the possibilities, um, but just really intrigued by all of the ways of um, pulling our resources together, seeing what was there, getting to know the partners, um, letting the partners know about us, to that kind of two-way communication that was really exciting. And... and I heard a couple comments about 
you know, finding out that so-and-so has been doing this thing for five years, so we don't need to do it. But then likewise, we've been doing this thing for five years, so you don't need to do it. And just that information exchange was great. Um, and then in terms of possibilities, there's a library that's going into a strategic planning process that would find this great. But we thought really any kind of new and exciting programs or services, I feel like this is a great um, way to build literally a net in terms of social justice issues and access to justice. Like I'm picturing the netting, like right now, kind of holding people up and supporting people. But that's what our map would build is those connections. That's what I got. I'm glad you brought that up because I think um, one of the things that's exciting to me about this is the the possibility of if you're if you're trying to be systematic if you're trying to make a map and then look at where the gaps are hopefully you will look in places you maybe wouldn't have looked based on your just traditional connections hopefully you'll be able to open up the scope a little bit and say who are we not who's not here who are, who are our regulars and who are who actually lives in our community and is doing stuff that never comes into the library or never never has any connection to us. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's exciting to me. Okay, does anyone from group three wanna speak? Brina, I think if you just nub on over to three, I think we should yes. still be able to see it. Awesome, okay. Anyone from group three? Group three was organized. Group three put things. You beautiful rows. rows. Group three, we commented on that. Used the same color. Who's responsible for that? Speak up. I mean, I'll speak if nobody else wants to. <laughs> um, I think that we came up with a lot of great stuff. We we discovered that community asset mapping can be helpful in a lot of different ways in terms of. Um, developing programming and finding out what other organizations are doing for programming. And then as a result of that, you can kind of cultivate your collection management if you know that another that the Historical Society is doing a program um, on such and such. You want to make sure that you might have materials to enhance that topic afterward. Um, there were a couple of us that are children's librarians. So in terms of outreach, um, like that Lindsay is community map that she had um, with the daycare centers and even in terms of knowing what businesses are available for summer reading prizes that would be good to just know what's out there um, knowing what other groups are doing so that you don't compete with them that we kind of collaborate together and not have the same kind of program at the same time um, matching people with services in town if you know what you have in town it helps you from a reference perspective um, create relationships with your patrons and the resources that they can use um, and i think oh community space creation knowing when there's a need for either digital space for an organization or physical space for meetings and things like that i think that was everything somebody else feel free to jump in if i miss stuff Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, I think I think you must have hit it all, Jennifer, because I don't see anyone else popping up with a yes and. So maybe our group one, our first and final group. I probably should have put those in a better order. Sorry. Did anyone yes. from group one um, want to talk about some of the barriers to community asset mapping? I think I was uh, voluntold at the t at the tail end of our, our group that that I would uh, I would talk for us. Um, so a lot of our um, a lot of our, our uh, barriers are things that I think are probably uh, issues that people run into in all aspects of library work. Um, you know, you had already mentioned being able to leave the library is a huge a huge one. Um, conflicting goals with other organizations. You know, when you're building those collaborations, if your goals. You know, if you want to collaborate with, for example, the schools, but your interest is in, or the schools want to collaborate with you, but you want to reach people who aren't coming into the library, but that's not necessarily going to be of interest to the schools. Um, 
or um, you know, getting town or community support. Um, we, we circled around a lot of issues around not being sure who the key players are. If you don't live in the town that you work in, uh, what many of us don't. Um, if you're new, um, you know, uh, somebody, somebody said, um, saying, hi, I'm from the library, doesn't always open all the doors you might want it to. Um, understanding um, what everybody actually does, you know, the assets in town, um, you know, and, and really that, that deep local knowledge um, that can be hard to build up, especially if you are, you know, an out-of-towner. Um, time and money always, always comes down, to, a lot of things come down to time and money, um, you know, politics, and again, thinking a lot about that issue around, you know, if you don't know what the potential, you know, political traps in town are and things like that. Um, you know, making sure you have a clear end goal that doesn't get um, tangled up in somebody else's end goals and other organizations' goals. Um, changes in your town that you might not be aware of, whether it's, you know, something in terms of all your stakeholders or something in terms of, um, you know, again, other people's goals. <laughs> um, and. Um, uh, so, and just, and making sure you have a good need, a needs assessment came up a bunch, um, and, you know, making sure you're not, um, what, what we would call in my household, at least, um, solutions looking for problems. Um, you know, you might think you're out looking, you're doing the right um, thing that would help your, your patrons, but it turns out, surprise, it's not actually very helpful at all. Um, and also just dealing with things like resistance to change, new ideas. Um, so, I, you know, I think we didn't get to talk too much about how you might address them, but I don't think... I think all of these types of barriers are things that we've all dealt with in all aspects of librarianship. Um, so we may have um, solutions that we've already tried for other purposes that would work well here mm -hmm. um, in terms of that kind of outreach and in terms of building those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't that doesn't always mean, make it easy or fun. <laughs> um, but right, right. If I missed anything, anybody else speak up? Thanks, Kate. I think that's a, a good, um, okay, you got a well done from your group. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, astute to, to realize that these, some of the, some of the barriers are the common barriers and that doesn't make them any less um, real. Um, I think one of the things, and some of the things that we're saying, we don't know, we don't know who the key players are. We don't know who's really controlling, but those are things that we need to know as a library. So whether it's this method or some other way, um, those are important things to, for the library to be aware of and, and because that will help us to, to work more effectively in the community. So I think maybe, um, one way to approach it is to say, start small, don't get overwhelmed, don't think that asset mapping is now this, like, this is how we're going to completely embed ourselves in the community, but this could be, we could just try out something small with one small set of people with one small program and um, kind of flesh it out according to these methods and then see if that helps us make some inroads in a place that that we needed, you know, in the direction that we want to go. Okay, so with a few minutes left, I did drop a link uh, to our survey in the chat. Please, please take it. Y'all know, y'all know how important these surveys are. So please take them. You will get an email um, with them later. But were there any other questions? maybe that came up during your um, small group breakout sessions or just sort of while you were listening to Verena, we are recording this, the recording will be made available. Um, but based off of some of our surveys and, and data that we've collected, it seems that community engagement aspects are what our librarians are asking for the most right now. So. You all have sent out the call. We have heard you. This is just one workshop that we are using and that we hope to um, sort of fill this bucket that, that you all may, may feel like needs a little, a little bit more to it. Um, so if there are any questions or thoughts, like please feel free, throw up that hand, just unmute yourself if you want. I mean, we're, we're kind of at the end of this. We don't 
want anyone to walk away from this um, feeling like, a question that they had wasn't answered. Um, and even if Verena or Ashley or myself don't have the answer right now, we can absolutely get back to you. Oh, great, just a kudos. You don't see a link to the survey? Well, there it is. Um, if I see, it's good to start small. Uh, maybe we need a help group getting people together who are working on this. Uh, Sure, sure, Ashley. Sorry, I was just putting the survey link in. Oh, okay, we could do that, right? Uh, so, so sure. it, it might be it might be beneficial for folks to kind of maybe get started, and then maybe we'll schedule a a, a follow up. Um, in a couple of, of weeks or months. And that way, if folks have run into barriers, then we can kind of crowdsource some solutions. Um, for those who have worked through, whoa, still no survey link? None of you guys are saying that? If, uh, and maybe for, for those of you who have made your way, oh, because I'm sending it to everyone in the waiting room like a silly person. Um, and then that way, for those of you who do find creative ways to work through those barriers, um, then you might be able to share that information with others. Clearly this coffee I'm drinking was not helping. I have a question. Any chance we could get a template to get people almost on a plan, a nice framework, and we can start by filling it in based on individual libraries' needs, but have a template? What do you think about that, Verena? We've got um, a lot of different library structures here, but I don't know. Yes. Um, the, the, there's a link to the, what the Free Library of Philadelphia is doing. They are using an IMLS, I think it's called Community Centered. I don't know what the grant is called, but they're, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be coming out with some curriculum later this year. But the link that I sent you does have, um, it's a, a presentation that they did at ALA Midwinter in the beginning of 2020. And there is, it's a template for doing this type of a presentation, but it includes some things that you can get started on. So there might be something in there that, um, that you can look at. Otherwise, yeah, I'll, I'll see if there's any other kind of template sort of thing that I can highlight and pass I just through. think it would be helpful to get us started because I think once we start going, we'll realize this isn't overwhelming, we can do this. Yeah. And it, you're still keeping it generic enough where we could customize it to our community. Yeah. But a template, I think, would be very helpful. Yep. And, and, and Ashley and I can, can do some poking around that, around that as well. Definitely. Thank you, Joanne. That's a, that's a great idea that I've, I've seen some folks in the chat um, also sort of do a, a thumbs up, too. Um, okay. Well, it's two after, and we want to be really respectful of your time. Please fill out that survey. Please, please. Um, Thank you, Verena, for taking time to come into the future, because we're an hour ahead of you, right? Uh, for future hopping up here to Connecticut to do this presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. I, I think this is a really good first step to doing some deep community engagement um, work. First, you have to know who your community is before you can move past that. And I think that community asset mapping is a great way to identify the members of your community. Um, so thank you so much for that. Bye. Thank you.